Dr. 9 TV. about seeing art on computers and would um, debate why that could be even uh, considered art. I don't see that anymore. I um, think there's a lot of openness to it right now and still a lot of education that is needed. I do not think that the aesthetics of the medium are deeply understood. We have hundreds of years of experience looking at paintings. We have internalized the uh, characteristics of the medium of uh, art, or you know, art or a painting per se, they understand what they are looking at. I do not think that is necessarily true for digital art. <laughs> and understanding its uh, generative, non-linear, real-time characteristics or the nature of algorithms. And that is getting more and more uh, complex as we are moving more into um, artificial intelligence and other um, areas that are becoming more dominant. So I think there's still a lot of learning and education involved in the process of showing the art. One of the areas that interests me a lot is that um, this notion of hacking systems. And it used to be, you know, a hack was something that you did to a computer system or you happened in, a, in the coding, but now, if you think about the city as a system with computation, with networks, with uh, the availability of geolocation information, you can hack the city in a lot of different ways, which is essentially a way of saying we can change how we live in the city, how we interact. I think oh, yeah. that's a very exciting platform for artists to play with. It's not just, you know, put the Picasso on the plaza anymore. It's like, change the plaza into something dynamic that changes all the time according to any given number of inputs, whether it's people or weather or financial markets. But it's a physical space, it's not just a gallery wall. So that's a really fun space to play in. I think about the notion of inclusion in the digital art world. By this inclusion, I mean the invisible walls that exist between gender, race, and class. So digital art is accessible through phones or laptop computers or by gallery exhibitions. But at the same time, it's not accessible for people who don't have access to those tools. So it, it's kind of a very esoteric and inaccessible genre where it's very available for part of the demographics and almost impossible to access for other parts of demographics. So I think about the video arts a lot and the, kind of the notion of um, public access television and how different means of distribution inspire the artists to create counter narrative to the mainstream media. So I think about like what is the counter web to the web 2.0 that we exist um, that exists today. What is the space that is alternative to the capitalist means of control and production for the art to exist? And I think that's the missing conversation. How can art exist outside of the given network or the internet as we know today? What is the internet that we could create as an artist? And perhaps it might not be called the internet. It could be something else. I absolutely think digital art is changing our conception of what art is. I mean, to me, it's it's intuitive and obvious that it is art, um, but our definitions and the gatekeeping that that comes up and around it is it's interesting. And I think that really ties into what class and um, education and our ideas of who can be an artist and who can't be. And that's thrilling. Whenever there is a disruptive force, or whether, whenever there is a field or a group of people who can overturn or mock or upset, I mean, that's what art needs. That's what art does really well. So you need people who are radical and and willing to 
work outside of institutional spaces, and I think digital art offers that. The animated GIF exists in this space between video and still image, right? Like, it, I think technically we can say it's a video, but the way we encounter it is, is very different. And that's basically because of the loop. You know, we don't watch the GIF once through and we're done. Um, the joy in the GIF is that we're seeing multiple times. And it's so short um, that it allows for that. The affordance of a GIF is, is, is amazing. So it's actually this sort of new phenomenon, um, relatively, that um, in, in a new medium, a new, a new form, effectively. Um, that is allowed by the forces of digital technology and, um, and, and networks. It's a you know a fertile space where a lot of fun experimentation is happening. Something a big thing that's missing from the conversation um, is uh, this acceptance of, of artifacts that may may not be art, but are I think still culturally significant. Digital art, just like all timeless media artworks, are really high maintenance. You have to take care of their um, preservation and long-term you know, ex uh, accessibility from day one when it enters your collection, um, which is why I think many museums and collectors who don't have dedicated conservation staff or don't have access to advisors simply shy away from collecting this. And this is a whole catch-22 where art digital art that doesn't get collected, also doesn't get the exposure through exhibition and loan processes, um, therefore it doesn't gain the significance in the art market, therefore it doesn't get collected. Um, so it's it's a complicated um, um, issue. I think, I do believe that we're making progress. However, especially um, due to the rise of the conservation discipline um, that um, allows collecting institutions and private collectors to have more trust in the long-term investment in those works. I'm always interested in what's fringe, what's on the outside, what nobody yet is talking about. And of course it's very hard to monetize that kind of work when we've got technophobia on the part of collectors. So there are you know, handfuls that step up to the plate and the challenge is knowing that they're going to have to upgrade software, the display format. So, but I think all art is risky, and all art um, takes special care and feeding. And what we call digital art now is the latest, um, has its own issues. One trend I've been interested in lately is actually less about digital creation than recreation. I keep seeing these artists going back to the 60s and 70s when, after all, there were a lot of instruction-based works, and using those kind of scores as a kind of a recipe for re-performing them in new digital media. So um, John F. Simon and Casey Reese have gone to Saul Lewitz wall drawings as a starting point, and then rendered them in these kind of mesmerizing, uh, sometimes moving images of, of lines and, and, and arcs. Now, Lewitt, it's easy because he's got his instructions on the wall label, but sometimes artists go and find things where there's no instructions and they kind of reverse engineer it. There's a group called Recode of artists creating open source versions of the artworks they find in vintage computer magazines from the 70s. And they just see an image, they say, oh, I, I think I could make that, and they use processing or job or whatever, and they, they then share the code that makes that image. And I think it's kind of exciting to see people reach into history, not by, you know, putting it on a pedestal or sort of, you know, studying it in this very detached way, but instead kind of getting their hands dirty, recreating it and experiencing a new version of it for contemporary audiences, while, of course, leaving the historical version in place. I'm really excited about where writing about digital art is going and where writing about digital technology or digital culture is going in general. I think the internet has affected and changed the way we read and write. Probably forever, I think that there's a lot of metaphors to think about writing online. Links and hyperlinks and protocols are all ways that I would like to think about how they affect the way we write. I think that writing for very specific attention spans might be a challenge, but might be an interesting challenge. I think that 
people who read ebooks are also people who read novels. I think that none of these forms are replacing each other, but in a really good environment, they will feed into each other. I think that the artist's, the artist's role is, uh, is really somewhere between what you might think of as like kind of the poetic or aesthetic and things that kind of can bring about change in society. I suppose if you really want to get something done, you have to, you have to kind of go into politics or um, or come up with uh, new policy platforms. Um, that's not the artist's job. The artist changes the world in a different way. And I think um, in some ways it might be simply by asking questions. In other cases, it might it might be a matter of. Um, of envisioning something, some sort of new cultural formation that allows for, that gives form to a kind of subjectivity that people need to like express in the world. Doctor Nine TV.